Our scripture now, just a single verse this morning from Jeremiah 29, 11. But before we begin, let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word. And as we read it this morning, we ask that you would bless it to our understanding. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So Jeremiah 29, verse 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto God. There was a farmer that had people, somebody, stealing his watermelon. He noticed every time he'd go out to his watermelon patch, somebody had stolen one. So he thought, well, I'll fix that. So he didn't really do it. But he put a sign out there that said, one of these watermelons is poison. <laughs> so that the person wouldn't know which one and couldn't steal it. But then he went out the next day and noticed that nobody had stolen the watermelon, but somebody had added to the sign and said, and now there's two. <laughs> <laughs> two watermelons. So I guess it's good news in that uh, nobody's going to steal his watermelon, but the bad news is he won't be able to eat them either because he won't know which one's poison or not. But that's often the way that it is in the world. Uh, good news and bad news often mix together. Um, it's rare that we ever just get solid good news all the time about everything, and it's rare that we ever just get all bad news all the time. Sometimes we get bad news, we think it's all bad all the time, but even still yet, there's good news in that. Um, for instance, this past week, I got good news. My, my nephew, who's been looking for a job, found one, which is good. And uh, for him, it's good news because he always wants to do this. But for us, we're kind of wary of it. He's going to be a police officer uh, in Chicago. And uh, so the good news is he got a job. Bad news is uh, for us is that it's a dangerous one. Uh, good news is he'll be closer to his family when he goes to Chicago, both us and and uh, his wife's family. The bad news is he's moving there from L.A., so he's going from perfect weather to freezing cold. So that's the way it is. You, know, you kind of get good news and bad news mixed together. Uh, and it's the same in the Scripture. You know, the Scripture is real life. Oftentimes we hear that you know, our faith is, you know, apple pie in the sky, the sweet by and by. Uh, and uh, sometimes it can be presented that way. But Scripture really shows us the truth of things in that, you know, life is a, a mixture of good things and bad things. We don't always get what we want, but then God also blesses us sometimes when, when we don't expect it. And this passage in Jeremiah 29 is one of those that uh, we can see that. Oftentimes, this one verse that we read for this morning, which says that God has plans for us, and they're plans for our good and not bad, and plans for our hope and our future, is read separately, like we read it this morning. And that's okay. That's a good thing. It's a good promise from God, and as good for us as it was for the people it was written for, uh, and it's a good one to remember. However, I think sometimes things can be even more meaningful when we take a look at the context that they're written in, both in the passage as a whole and in the historical context that they were written in uh, to the people they were written to originally, what they were dealing with. And that's certainly true in this case. In this passage, the prophet Jeremiah has sent a letter containing what the Lord has said to him to people who have been exiled to Babylon. Now, Jeremiah had prophesied that the Babylonians were going to come and destroy Jerusalem and they did. The Babylons conquered Judah. They destroyed Jerusalem, and it was absolutely devastating. Uh, Judah lost its place in its nation. Jerusalem was leveled. The temple was plundered and completely destroyed. Not one stone left upon another. And then worse even still yet, the people that were left, uh, the Babylonians exiled them from their homeland, from one end of their empire to the other, particularly those who might have skills, that they could use or people who might be leaders in their community, they took them to take back to their own homeland and use for their own purposes. But in scattering the, the people of Judah all over the empire, they kept them from conglomerating together and hopefully would keep them from causing trouble, they thought. Uh, and oftentimes in that situation, this is what they did with more than just the people of Judah, just about everybody they conquered they did this to, and would make those people assimilate into society around them. They'll become Babylonians themselves eventually, they think. 
And so these people uh, who had been exiled, who had lost everything, including their homeland, these are the ones that Jeremiah is writing this letter to. And it contains the passage we read this morning. But it starts off with something that may not have been great good news to those who were waiting. They were probably hoping that the Lord would tell them that they would be going home soon, that the Babylonians would be defeated, and that next week, next month, next year, they'll be back home and everything will be okay. However, when you read the whole letter, what it says in essence is, you're going to be here for 70 years. The Lord tells them, you're going to be living in exile for 70 years. And that would be a hard thing for many of them to realize, that for that long, that means that a great many of them are not going to see their homeland again. They're going to die in exile, and they're going to be raising their families in exile far from home. And he instructs them, telling them what you need to do, basically, is start your lives anew where you are. You need to start all over here. You need to build a home and live in it. You need to plant a garden and eat the produce from it. You need to marry and raise children and make sure your children are well suited and taken care of because they're going to begin their lives in exile. And he tells them they need to seek the welfare of the city where they live. Even though they're living in a pagan city far from their home, they are to pray that that city and where they live prospers as well. Because as that city prospers, the Lord tells them, so you'll prosper along with it. And so this was probably not what they wanted to hear. That they wouldn't be going home next week, that it's going to be 70 years. So they just need basically to start their lives where they are and live it as they're there. Apparently there must have been some false prophets going around telling them what they wanted to hear, that they would be going home soon. The Babylonians would be defeated. But God says, don't listen to these folks. You know, undoubtedly, kind of like folks sometimes who call themselves prophets today, uh, they probably double down on being wrong rather than just saying, you know, I was wrong. They might have said, well, the Lord said we're going home next month. And, well, since so the next month came, well, it'll be next month. And then that month came, well, next month. And then next month. Uh, the Lord says, don't listen to them. You know, in the scripture, one of the hallmarks of the prophet is they're right. You know, if they're a prophet of God, what they say is true. Uh, so he says, don't listen to these folks. Uh, so get ready and, and just prepare your life as it is. And also, apparently, it, it's probably going to be a time when it may seem to these Israelites that God is somewhat distant from them. Because it says that they'll be there 70 years, but then they'll be called home. And when they're called home, it says, then you'll call upon me and I'll answer you. You'll seek me and find me. That doesn't mean that God is not with them in exile. He's with them there. But it just may seem that they, God maybe is a little distant. And sometimes we have that feeling as well. There are times we go through it, it may seem like God is distant. We may say, like the psalmist does sometimes, God, where are you? Um, God hasn't abandoned us. God hasn't left us. But there are times when God seems to be quiet or silent. In fact, we read in, in between the Old Testament and the New Testament of what we call the 400 years of silence. There were 400 years when no prophet spoke in Israel during those times. So there are times when God is not absent. He's not asleep, but he may be silent or quiet. But the Lord tells them that despite all this news that they probably didn't want to hear, the good news is that God does have a plan for them. And it is a plan for good, and a plan for their hope, and a plan for their future, and that they will go home, uh, and that everything will be made right. But God is going to do that in his perfect time, will, and way. So we can see that in the scripture, that in the whole context of this passage, in the whole context of history, that you know, God does in the end promise good things for his people. But that is even more meaningful when you realize that, you know, they, like us, uh, don't have completely perfect lives all the time. That God promises us good things doesn't mean that it's going to be perfect without shadow and blemish and everything is going to be positive all the time. You know, sometimes you kind of get that message from some Christian folks that everything is just great all the time and perfect and wonderful. And then you wonder when your life falls apart, what's wrong with me? You know, all these other people have these perfect lives. Why is my life not perfect? Well, you know, the fact is none of us have those perfect lives. All of us have problems and troubles. And, you know, there will be bad things that happen. And we'll have to endure things we don't want to endure. And there will be times that will be uncertain. 
And there are times it may be when we're not where we want to be. We may want to be somewhere else in life, uh, you know, doing something else or somewhere further advanced than we are, uh, you know, and we thought we'd be further along than we are. Um, and we're not. But God promises the people that in the end, hold on to faith, hold on to prayer, and God will keep his promises. God promises that his word will never return void. That means that whatever God speaks will do its purpose. That it will do what it sets out to do. And so when we hold on to God's promises and speak them, they will turn out uh, to do what God says. And God has proven himself to be completely trustworthy. In the meantime, like the Israelites of old, if we find ourselves in those situations uh, where we you know, are enduring things we'd rather not endure and maybe not where we would wish to be in life. Then, of course, we keep praying. We pray without ceasing. We don't let go of God's promises. We keep the hope. We keep the faith. And in the meantime, we make our lives useful where we are. We make our lives good and pleasant where we can find ourselves in the moment. And we serve God where we are, when we can, and how we can. We can't sit around waiting for God to fly us out on a magic carpet somewhere where we think we ought to be. Occasionally, God does work great miracles, but the reason they're called miracles is because they don't happen every moment, right? They have miracles because it's exciting, it's different, it's not expected. And God does work a lot of those. However, God most often works with us as we work. You know, God goes with us as we go. He told the children of Israel when they went into the Promised Land, I will go with you as you go. Wherever your feet tread, I will be with you. So they had to do the walking. You know, they couldn't just fly in. Uh, they had to do the actual walking. Sometimes we too have to do the actual walking. But God can use us where we are. And it may be this is where we're called to be, where we may find ourselves. Um, there may be things we need to do. There may be people we need to meet. You know, we need to realize that, that all of life isn't about us. You know, it's about... You know, other people as well. And maybe that other people have been praying and we are their answer. You know, God is sending us to be the answer to their prayer. Or it may be God is sending people to us who are the answer to our prayers. And again, it may be that we have things we need to learn, things we need to see, experiences we need to have that will be meaningful to us in the future. So, you know, the things where we may be may not be where we could always desire to be, but God can use us where we are and will use us where we are if we open ourselves up to him and say, here, Lord, use me. But if you say that, watch out. God will use you. Uh, and maybe in ways you didn't expect. So realize that in life, certainly we know that good and bad mix together. But God will sustain us in the good things even in the midst of the bad things. God does have plans for us. Plans for our good, plans for our joy, plans of hope and plans for the future and those are coming to pass even in the midst of life as we live even in the messiness of life even in the confusion of life and the setbacks and disappointments that we sometimes have to endure even in the midst of the inconveniences and frustrations and uncertainties we have to have and then sometimes even in the midst of life when it's just absolutely boring you know sometimes as life may life is you just got to do the drudgery of the day living but realizing then, of course, that God is working, God is moving, God does love us and care for us, and that as we serve God, nothing we do is a small thing. Everything that we do is important to God in some way, and probably important to somebody else in ways we'll never realize. It's probably a good thing we don't know all the things that we do that maybe God's helping others through us, because we, you know, probably get the big head thing. I did that. Yeah. No, God did that three months. I've told you the story before, and there's nothing worse than hearing the story again, but I'm going to tell it again because it's one of my favorite ones about how even the smallest things we do are powerfully meaningful. During World War II, there was a, a bomber, a B-17 bomber, uh, and it was cap captained by a man whose last name was Fox. And the plane was shot all to pieces going over Europe one time, and they barely made it home, uh, landed in England. And when they got out, they saw there were two or three unexploded anti-aircraft shells stuck in the side of the plane. 
If any one of those would have gone off, it would have destroyed the plane and killed everybody on it. So the men sank to their knees, realizing how close they had come to die. So the armorer, when they were fixing the plane, took the unexploded shells to look at them and see why they didn't explode. And later, Captain Fox went, and the armorer told him they didn't explode because there were no explosives in them. Said uh, there were, however, notes in them. And said they were written in a language I don't know, so we sent them off to the intelligence people. Well, eventually, word came back to Captain Fox that those notes said simply, this is all we can do for you now. We're sorry. Somewhere in the heart of darkness, in one of Hitler's slave labor camps where people were forced to do things for the Nazis, forced to make ammunition for them. One slave laborer, or more than that, risked their life to not put explosives in one of the shells and stuck a note in saying, this is all we can do for you. But think about it. He didn't think it was much who ever did that, but it was life to the men on that plane. Every man on that plane owed their life to that one person doing that one thing that they probably never knew how it ended up. But it was life to them and their families and their children and to their children's children. It may be the same things with us. Things we do may seem small and, and may not seem like they mean much, but we don't know how it ripples from harm, the things that we do, how they may end up. So God does work in our lives, even in the midst of the goodness and badness we have mixed together. In the context of our lives, God is faithful. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that you are with us, that you guide us and direct us, that you work through us, and that you work with others around us. We thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers and answer, and we thank you that you hear the prayers of others and answer. Help us when we are the answers to those prayers of others that we do what you call us to do. Help us, Lord, to have the faith and strength to stand up and say, Here I am, Lord, use me wherever we may be at the moment, realizing that that is where you have called us to be. Help us, Lord, to have faith in you that you do have plans for us, even in the midst of messiness that life may be now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.